My name is Tarmac, and this is your Game Industry News Wrap-Up for the week of November 4th, 2017. Our title story this week comes from Sledgehammer and Activision Blizzard with the release of Call of Duty World War II. From the beaches of Normandy to a whole bunch of other muddy battles, the new COD is receiving good reviews, but does have a few people concerned about how sensitive it is to the fact that World War II was an immense tragedy for many. Specifically in the game, there's a social area in multiplayer where you can buy various items, do some shooting gallery training, and run around with other people. It's a lobby of sorts, which resides on the beaches of Normandy after the battle was won. And you get daily quests here, for things like winning a certain number of multiplayer matches, or, say, watching another player open three loot boxes. Yep, on the field of a battle where more than 425,000 people lost their lives, you can get yourself a loot box by watching other players open their loot boxes. Press F and enter your credit card to pay your respects. Razer, the makers of overpriced peripherals and a certain danger noodle named Mouse that I still have to RMA because its wheel is acting like an epileptic water buffalo, have finally revealed the Razer phone. At a London event, the Razer smartphone offers what Razer described as no compromise mobile gaming. The no compromise phone includes a high performance with a great screen and Dolby Atmos audio, lacking the cumbersome headphone jack, any appreciable advancement in mobile game controls, as well as avoiding those silly rounded edges that make phones so comfortable to have in your pocket. As yet, the intended market for this phone is somewhat nebulous, but I suspect a significant crossover with the market for Axe Body Spray and Blue Yeti and Snowball microphones. Continuing the trend of praising your dog for not ripping up the couch cushions, Phoenix Labs and Capcom are avoiding loot boxes in a couple of upcoming games. Monster Hunter World has been said by Capcom that, quote, you've already kind of got loot as a core gameplay aspect without having to shove a microtransaction version of it in, end quote. Similarly, Dauntless, a monster hunting game currently in closed beta, has had loot boxes for a while now, but is removing them in favor of a system more closely related to Path of Exile and Warframe, where players can pick and choose what they want to buy instead of being randomly given mostly trash in hopes of the occasional good item. To quote co-founder Jesse Houston, quote, I do not want to build a company that is known for being able to extract capital or some other bullshit out of players, end quote. It's sad that we've gotten to the state where the expected position is worthy of mass praise, but there you have it. Whether this was done out of genuine concern for the players or just for PR is irrelevant. Either way, it pushes in a direction that is more player-friendly and should be acknowledged on that basis. Don't eat the couch cushions. Good dog. Nintendo is doing really well despite the predictions of many, totally not me at all, okay, maybe it was me, that the Switch could be swarmed with problems. Both Breath of the Wild and Super Mario Odyssey have had amazing sales and are being hailed as the new legacy of Nintendo going forward, which is pretty great to see. Nintendo also called a few arguments recently regarding how the Switch itself is used. One of the many criticisms leveled at them was that most people would just leave the unit docked and treat it as a traditional console. Turns out that 30% of Switch owners play primarily in handheld mode, about 50% play in both docked and undocked modes, leaving just under 20% of Switch owners that play primarily with their system attached to a TV. At this point, I'm so close to buying a Switch that I can almost taste the anti-toddler eating cartridges. On November 19th, GameStop is becoming Blockbuster. The brick-and-mortar game retailer is bringing a new system called PowerPass to its customer base, which is a game rental service where $60 gets you unlimited rentals for six months. Gamers can take home any used game they like from GameStop and swap that used game out at any time, with the added bonus of getting to keep the last game they rented at the end of the six-month period. It seems, in my view, to be a great program, allowing gamers to play a ton of stuff for very little overall investment and keeping the last game at the end is a great little benefit. That said, it's also very obviously a capitulation as a result of some very bad quarters of declining revenue for the troubled retailer. Years ago, I made a few predictions about the future of brick and mortar stores and if GameStop fails, which could well happen in the next five years or so, be prepared for a rapid shift to digital only and a dramatic decrease in the amount of PopCap figures on the market. Chinese publisher Perfect World is shutting down two studios as of last week. Both Motiga, developers of the game Gigantic, and Runic, the devs behind the Torchlight series and Hob, are being put to bed. Perfect World cited very little in their press release on the matter other than the closures being unrelated. Unrelated with the exception of monetary reasons, I'm sure. In a year which has seen the loss of Visceral and Bioware Montreal, to see further studio closures is a hit which is always terrible to see. 
If you work in the game industry and have the ability to reach out to these affected studios to possibly offer work, I'm sure it would be appreciated. Unfortunately, gamers don't have very much that we can do other than supporting great games by great developers. I'm sure I'm not the only one who's tired of seeing studios close to pivot games that would otherwise be very profitable already to games as a service, which is simply more profitable all around. Sometimes in business, reputation matters, and I have a feeling that if the microtransaction bubble bursts, we're going to see more of this happening in a real hurry. BlizzCon happened this past week, and while not a huge amount from the con excited me personally, we did get some pretty big news on the StarCraft and World of Warcraft fronts. To start, StarCraft 2 is going free to play, mostly. November 14th, the Wings of Liberty campaign will be free to everyone, as will Unranked and Versus AI modes. Gamers who win 10 first wins of the day will also unlock the Ranked mode, and all commanders are now free up to level 5, at which point you would need to pay for them to unlock further progression. On the World of Warcraft front, we have a new expansion announcement in the Battle for Azeroth, which pits the Horde and Alliance against each other yet again, but the more surprising news for WoW players was that Blizzard is working on a classic vanilla WoW game server. The controversy surrounding the Nostalrius classic WoW project seems to have borne some fruit, and while they're always cagey around release dates, with any luck we'll see this soon. I've already suggested to a few of my old guildmates that maybe we need to get the crew back together, so that collectively we can all realize why we don't play WoW anymore. Sony has had to defend the recent presentation of The Last of Us 2 trailer during their PlayStation Media Showcase event at the Paris Games Week. The Last of Us 2 trailer introduces a few characters with a rather significant display of torture involving a hammer, a knife, and a rope. Jim Ryan, the president of Sony Interactive Entertainment Europe, explained that it is, quote, a game made by adults to be played by adults, end quote. Still, unlike the previous Last of Us 2 trailer, which showed a huge amount of emotion and character development for Ellie, who is now grown up, the most recent trailer misses the boat on any of that intricacy and does seem to be little more than shock value. I'm all for violence in video games, but it's a bit on the nose to play that trailer at the same press event that Concrete Genie was announced, a game about painting away your troubles to overcome bullying. And our uplifting game story of the week comes from me. November 4th was the Extra Life Game Day, so in regular fashion I totally forgot until the last minute and I scheduled my podcast on the same day. After a two and a half hour podcast, I got up on stream again to play Chrono Trigger, and I managed to last for a total of 12 hours of live broadcast, raising an incredible $245 for the Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton. While it may not sound amazing, it's well over double what I was hoping for, and I'm ecstatic at the generosity of gamers. We also contributed to the Stollery winning an extra 30000 in donation funding from the ESA by raising the most money per capita in the Extra Life Challenge. Amazing stuff and a great reminder that gamers are awesome. Your game releases for the week of November 5th to 11th are as follows. On November 7th, we get the release of Super Lucky's Tale, a tale about a fox with a tail tailing a bunch of bad guys without tails on Xbox and Windows 10 via the Xbox Play Anywhere program. It's a 3D puzzle platformer which started its life as a VR game for the Oculus Rift, with Super Lucky's Tale being the sequel. It's also a game in that AA tier, which means its pricing is a nice and low $30 US. Also on November 7th, a return to form with Sonic Forces. Sonic makes a triumphant comeback with both 3D and 2D sections of the speed-filled Hedgehog Classic. Sonic Forces also includes a build-your-own hedgehog mode, where players can mix and match a bunch of cosmetic items to make their own character. It's entirely possible that this is the first Sonic game released in 20 years that doesn't suck. On November 7th, yet again, we have the release of the Frozen Wilds expansion to Horizon Zero Dawn on PlayStation 4, a game with so many different names at this point that I'm a bit worried for what the next expansion might be called. Alloy takes her hatred for machines a step further by venturing into the Frozen North to solve a new mystery. And let me tell you, as a Canadian whose front lawn is covered in Frozen North, that mystery is that it's just too damn cold. Why do I live where the air hurts my face? And finally, a game that I'm willing to bet none of you have ever heard of called Heroes of the Monkey Tavern releases on Nintendo Switch November 7th as well. The game has been out on Steam for a while now, and it caught my eye. Where have I seen that font before? Oh right, from a game near and dear to my heart that is unlikely to have licensed the design out because it belongs to Electronic Arts. I shouldn't be giving it attention, but seriously, trademark infringement is a thing, folks. 
This has been your Game Industry News Wrap-Up for the week of November 4th, 2017. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of the new folks who have found this YouTube channel as a result of the games are not too expensive to make video. Seeing a whole bunch of new growth like that is a bit intoxicating. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch the stuff that I make, and I hope that like many before you, it's an enjoyable and informative stay. My name is Tarmac. Thanks for watching. <laughs>